One person I'm excited to introduce to you for the first time uh, in person is Scott, who is an uh, independent man. He's got quite a large following on YouTube. And uh, he's going to get up here, and we're going to have a bit of a back and forth uh, together, uh, because that's how we plan to do it. So uh, please give it up for Scott Crow, the independent man. <laughs> Thanks for, for coming to my outing. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to get you to share with everyone here and, and with me for my own curiosity is um, a bit of the story of how, how you came to get involved with uh, YouTube media content. Like, what was the bugbear that drove you to, um, to come up and, and speak out as you did? Um, who, knows, who knows about... Oh, sorry. Who knows about Gamergate? Who, who's, um, who doesn't know about Gamergate? Okay, um, I'll try and break it down really quickly. I think it was about 2013, 20, 2013. Um, a bunch of feminist and social justice warriors decided to attack the gaming community. I'm not close enough. <coughs> the gaming community, both the users and the producers of games. Um, they came in and told them they're a bunch of misogynists, that the, the female char characters are sexualized and that you know, they're all horrible people and they need to go back to the drawing board and remake their games. And the, um, the game has basically said, piss off. They, they, and, but the, the interesting part was that the media actually took the side of the social justice warriors and turned on the gamers. But it created this um, real battle. And um, the gamers stood by and, and I think it's fair to say that they won that battle. And so that's what lured me into this world of YouTube because there's a lot of people on YouTube creating videos about this uh, sort of battle that was going on. And people like Thunderfoot, some of you may know, making videos about Anita Sarkeesian, who was sort of the main protagonist there, or one of them. Um, and so that, that lured me in, and I found myself you know, just watching more and more YouTube, and I thought, I can do this kind of stuff. But whilst I was doing this, I was living in Japan at the time. So most of the things that I was viewing was coming out of the United States. Um, so when I, I actually just moved back to Australia in February 2016 after being overseas for 15 years and I thought maybe naively that Australia had passed under the radar and maybe we hadn't been infected with this social justice, cultural Marxism and I come back and Jesus was I disappointed. Um, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. So I came back in February uh, last year, I watched a couple of episodes of Q&A and I was done. I, I was, <laughs> I was, um, I was sold. I had to get into this YouTube thing. So I'd, I'd been thinking it over, and it wasn't until I got back here and saw the situation in Australia and thought, yeah, I've just got to get into the debate. That's all. Just got to put stuff out there and, and see what happens. Now, I think it's funny. Um, I think frustration with Q&A was what drove us to make our first video too, ironically. Um, so where did, where did you start? Um, what topics did you broach first, and, and where did you find your first sort of spike in popularity came I, from? I, I think it was... Um, I think it was uh, from memory, if I go back to the first video, it was Michaelia Cash on Q&A, um, nodding her head in agreement with um, uh, Mia Friedman. On fem they were bas basically bullying Michaelia Cash into saying that she was a feminist. Um, they were talking about the wage gap, domestic violence, um, you know, the big, three of, the big three of feminism. Wage gap, domestic violence is perva a pervasive e epidemic, and um, rape culture, basically. You know, the big three. I mean, feminism is the hallmark of fake news, those, those three things alone. Um, um, so, yeah, that, that was it. And I think I have a background in finance uh, a long time ago. I, I was a teacher in Japan, but I have a background in finance. And what I thought I could bring to it was just Having a look at the data, I mean, it's so easy. You just go to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, download the domestic violence data and have a look at it. There is no epidemic. It's been, it's, it's been flat from the personal safety survey from 2005 to 2012, it hasn't moved. Uh, before that, it's actually been coming down. Um, violence in general has been coming down. Um, the idea that it's pervasive across society, the same, like it's the same in Double Bay as it is in Moree, is just absolutely absurd. Again, the same statistics bear all that out. So I thought that what I could bring to YouTube was a bit of an analytical bent, uh, show the statistics and just show that it's, you know, they're, they're just pushing a narrative and it's, it's fear-mongering, it's, 
It's um, the victim mentality, and um, that's just trying to bring some rigor to the debate. Now, I know that um, you've been able to successfully monetize your platform, mm -hmm. um, but the social justice cancer has leaked into YouTube quite recently, yeah, and I yeah. think you could share with the audience a bit of your experience with that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how many people following this very closely, the, the PewDiePie... Um, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah? Okay, we know. So PewDiePie put out a, a few videos that had some, shall we say, anti-Semitic imagery in him, but he, PewDiePie is a... Um, Comedian, essentially. So it was all satire, and of course the Wall Street Journal jumped on it and said, "Look at this hate, you know, it's, it's hate videos, and it's being all these large corporations are running their ads against them, and so all these large corporations have boycotted YouTube, pulled all their ads off, and until you get rid of the hate speech, so YouTube's been going through and systematically cleaning up, and they're just sidelining anything that's vaguely um, controversial or sensitive. So anything in the politics realm." anything, um, sort of culture wars stuff, all of that stuff's being, you can't monetize your content. You can still put it up, but you can't make any money off it. So that's kicked a lot of um, YouTube channels in the guts. And they're, but I think in some ways it's um, forcing people to innovate and look for other ways to make money. So there's a positive and a negative to it, but YouTube is still the only game in town really for monetizing on platforms. Mines, yeah, mines.com. Yeah, they, they still won't let me monetize on there. I've, I've sent them hundreds of messages and can't get anything. Well, that'll be a growing platform, I think. And, and as you said, um, <laughs> when, we, when we meet the uh, resistance of um, the mainstream or, or the corporate interests or whatever it is that try to prevent us from having a platform with which to freely exchange ideas, yeah. um, that's when we're forced to innovate. Um, and the phrase has been kicked around quite a bit um, at the conference this weekend, and I, and I think I've heard it first from Nick Gillespie on Friday night, was this uh, permissionless innovation. Um, we're, seeing the, we're seeing it work so well um, for other organisations, and, and maybe now's the time for people in the alternative media and technologists to come together and, and create new platforms that aren't going to be uh, infected by the SJW cancer. Cool. All right. Thanks, Scott. Please put your hands together for Scott, independent man.